So welcome to the Women Matters session of April 2019. And today we had planned to talk about the residue we have in second or even third generation maybe of what has happened in Europe or in the whole world in the 30s and 40s. And um, we were waiting for Dorothy and some other people who had to leave Europe because of obvious reasons, because they were in danger of being killed, with other words. So we hope uh, they come and we will see how, how it goes. Uh, but before we start, I wanted to share with you what I experienced this Saturday. There was a memorial right on the, on the top of the hill. We had to walk an hour, about an hour in a little chapel. And on the 13th of April, so like last Saturday, 75 years ago, there the Germans had found uh, that there were eight American war prisoners who had been able to flee from a transport who was bombarded. And they were able, with the support of the village, to hide up there. And the Germans came and shot them. And so there was this wonderful memorial service. Now I'm crying again. Wow. And afterwards there was um, a, a big um, gathering in a big uh, um, hall where we ate and everything. And people stepped up and shared their memories. There was a 97 old English officer who shared his experience. And there were people who still as children had witnessed um, the boy, a boy who came to ask for food in the evening and next day his father had to do the burrows and they recognized him at, on his uh, wing. Anyway, Germans didn't seem to be there except me. So at a certain point I stood up and went to the microphone and uh, excused for, for what we did. And that, you know, I'm crying, and I did cry. So, what has happened then, also we were not there, is still impacting me a lot. And I thought for today, I just wanted to invite you to share how your childhood was and how much you were aware of things which were going on in your country you are not Europeans, Luna and, and Tammy, and uh, how f far we were aware what was happening in our country before we were born. How did your parents tell you? How did they tell you? Did the school tell you? And how did you handle that? And how much or not, what way do you still feel to be impacted by what has happened then? Dorothy today sent around um, a, uh, uh, an article about Germany having done a lot of trying to clean up this mess by recognizing what has happened and that now, so many years afterwards, 40% of the younger people don't know anymore anything about what has happened and that new anti-Semitism and new uh, right-wing, extreme right-wing uh, ideas get uh, fashionable again. So this is the context in which I would like to unfold this conversation. And whoever wants to go first, I won't because I'm still a little bit in this strange mood. Thank you for sharing that, Heidi. Um, <clears throat> I, I think I just want to say that um, that my experience of being a North American, um, my mom grew up in London, and my grandmother was sent out of London. She grew up in bomb shelters and also was sent away. Um, I know it's deeply affected me. And through doing the systemic constellation work that I do, I've been able to see how it's shown up because it was very hidden and covert. But I, I do feel that it 
it affects all of us. We're a global family and that we're all affected by war and we're all affected by um, having to flee our territories. Yeah. And for me, the way that it's shown up is um, a history of hiding, I call it. So uh, it's been more subtle or hidden ways where I've felt like it's not okay to be me. Like it's not okay to be seen. It's not safe to be me. And it's been a lot of unpacking to see where systemically that comes from. Um, but my ancestors had to hide to survive. And so it, it's now becoming very clear as I understand more of the history and, and what my ancestors experienced through living through the war. Are some of them surviving, some of them not? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I feel that um, until we begin to look um, systemically at why we do do things, we will repeat because the trauma is so deep and it, and it really is encoded in us. And it's really important that we have these conversations and that we make it, we make it seen. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I also think that it is very important that we talk about this, as I wrote in the email. I have two background countries, basically. So I will talk about both. I was born in Hungary. And then when I was very little, I was only three years old when we moved to what was at that time East Germany. And that was a very interesting place to be. Um, and it was way after the war. I was born in the 70s. Hungary was very quiet, very looking quite civilized. I think Hungary has not done any of the work that, for example, Germany has done by working through the trauma, by working through its own guilt. Um, Hungary is very good at pushing that aside, unfortunately. And I think that's the reason why today such kind of politics is on the rise again in this country. Anti-Semitism is rising, a kind of Nazi-style regime is rising, and it's not good. It really is not. Uh, so I'm not feeling comfortable here, and I'm not feeling um, that things are going in the right direction. And I think that is because Hungary has not dealt with the past. I really think we have not. As for East Germany, I think it was quite interesting because it was the... It was, it was another extreme. At that time, it was a communist country, obviously. And it, there was a lot of dark stuff in the air, even though like I was a Hungarian citizen. So I was, and, and I was a little child, you know, so nothing personally happened against me or nothing happened to me. But even like as a four or five year old, I constantly was aware that something was wrong. And I was not able to pin it down, but I felt that I'm not in a normal country, even though I didn't know anything else. But there was a constant, like a politics of fear that was going on. And I think that was probably quite general in the Cold War everywhere in the world. But in this particular country, it was quite strong. So we even had to do like military style training in school and learning about the weapons of the German army at the age of six. And the Americans were the big kind of scary enemy and they were always threatening with the atomic bomb and things like that. And I remember I woke up in the middle of the night checking out of the window whether the atomic bomb is gonna come. So we grew up in this sort of regime of fear or when you cross the border then the 
border control was like looking into your suitcase and looking into your trucks and everywhere. And you constantly felt like you did something wrong, even if you didn't have anything with you that was not permitted. And I, I very much feel the same, like, uh, like what you said, that uh, it, it, is a, it, it creates a psychology of hiding. I feel like that my whole life as well, that something is not right with me. If someone is asking me a question, they try to catch me with something, even though I haven't done anything wrong, even though they don't have the right to do that. But it's still somewhere there in the subconscious. And I find it's one of the great works that we are doing is to get rid of that, to just start to feel okay about who we are. And um, I think it helps a lot to even catch ourselves when we are doing something differently because we have that fear. And then to say, no, this is the fear. This is the fear talking. This is the product of the fear. And then let go of that and try to find a way that is more authentic. And I think it's a very worthwhile journey. So yeah, that I can say for it for the beginning. <laughs> I have a suggestion that we say our names before we talk so we can. Yeah. So I was Victoria. <laughs> My name is Luna. <laughs> Luna Ciavelli. All right, uh, I'd like to continue. My name is Monia. I was born in Vienna, November 1941. And so as a child, I witnessed bombs, ruins. Uh, I was never aware that there wasn't enough food because my grandmother, always went to the farmers and got some food. Of course, she had to pass a lot of checkpoints everywhere then, even after the war. Um, to me, uh, these years forced a deep suspicion what authority or grown-ups at that time concerned. I was in the bomb cellar with my mother and even my father once when he came home and I could sense their helplessness. Uh, I could sense the fear. I could hear the bombs falling. I could smell the dust. Luckily, our house was never hit, but uh, one of my favorite dolls was torn apart by part of a bomb, by a shrapnel, uh, that stuck finally in the little cabinet where she was sitting. And I also remember this green eye of the radio where you could tune into and hear if new airplanes were coming to bomb you. And then you had to go into the cellar. And I also remember Russians as being most dangerous people because they crawled over the walls. This is one memory I have. And luckily our uh, one person in our house spoke Czech and a little Russian, so they left us alone. But of course, as you all know, what happened in other parts of the country, uh, and women suffered from this for the rest of their lives, being uh, mutilated or their children. I had a cousin who was who died when he was only six, I believe. Yes, I was ten then. It was the first dead person I saw, and that was a child. At that time, it was just you didn't hide them in coffins. He was just there, and he was very small, and he suffered from. Uh, his mother was treated with. Uh, uh, 
uh, against syphilis because uh, of what happened to her and that affected the child and so he died of leukemia at age six. I don't know how my, I have a cousin, a female cousin who is one year younger than I am. I don't know how she, she we never talk about that, what happened to her brother. And we make a lot of jokes when we meet and we have fun, but we never talk about it. Um, my father was uh, with the, had to be with the army, but he was, he refused to join the party and that affected, first of all, where he was positioned. He was sent against Russia and after the, and he was not allowed to continue his studies. He was a dentist. So the rest of my family or relatives uh, who were, oh, I'm sort of, yeah, now I'm back again. The rest of my relatives who were with the party, they finished their studies and they could start to work. And, uh, but Amazingly enough, we still held contact after the war and there was no, uh, yeah, there was no animosity. I think people understood why some people joined the party and some didn't and respected that or at least uh, took it as it was. Yeah, so far... Uh, my memories until 1945 and I still remember how my father came back and how my mother was just expecting couldn't hardly wait until he came and the other thing I remember is that I got a white teddy bear when I was three years old and I had it for the rest of my life because it was just the most amazing thing I ever saw my grandmother had sewn all my dolls and my uh, and this teddy bear was he came from paris that was when the german austrian army occupied paris and yeah okay so far Gertrud from Germany. <clears throat> um, I was born after the war, 56. Um, but my, so I know war only from um, sharing with my parents. Uh, when I was a kid, we used to go, we were seven children, and on Sundays we were going these uh, circle hiking tours, so for two or three hours to, to walk with a hike with the whole family. And when we came to some area, some, a little hill, three bushes at a certain place, my father said, oh, this is like in Sevastopol or wherever he was in the Russian, uh, he went as a soldier to, to Russia. And so we were in the middle, or he was in the middle of the war. And so he was sitting there and the Russians came from the other side and then this and that happened. So, I think it was hardly a Sunday that that didn't happen. So he was so much like this. He was there as soon as he saw something that resembled what he saw in Russia or the, the Crimea. And he told many stories. So I'm, I'm rather happy that he talked. <laughs> because hiding it and don't talking about it would have been more like in the hidden 
section. But it was pretty stressful <laughs> to, to talk about war all the time when, when you just had fun and wanted to see nature or and climb a tree or whatever. And he was um, cannoneer, what do you call it? So he was in the tank shooting. And I never dared to ask him what he thought about how many people died because of what he was ordered to do. But I think he had a big load with that. Um, and he was talking about the Russian, so not the Russians, but it was like the enemy. So it was the whole group in one, as one person. So I think he could manage that, that he didn't. So I was in front of the Russian. So not, I killed, I don't know, 50 people. <laughs> so I think a lot more, but I, I don't, I don't know how much, how many and how many encounters with the Russian she uh, he had. And he was uh, wounded. So he had to come back uh, in, the, in, in the clinic and there he met my mother again. <laughs> and because of that, he couldn't go to, to the front, but uh, was then when the Americans came, they put him in charge of young kids. I mean, they were, I don't know, 14, 15, 17. Uh, to hold a bridge that was not holdable. <laughs> and so he gave in, he, he handed over the whole group and was in American, um, American prisoner of war. I think because of his wound, otherwise he might have been in Russia and never came back. But um, so he was for four years or so. For, he was in Marseille in a prison of war camp with thousands of other. Yeah. So he was neither a friend of the Russians nor the Americans. <laughs> but it was uh, pretty. And my mother. Uh, she lost a brother, her youngest brother. He never came back. He was, I don't know exactly where he was. Um, and my father's sister, her husband, they, they call, he was missed. <laughs> So for many, many years, even after the war, and I think I was 10 or, or even older, when they finally realized where he died, but there was always looming over the family. And his mother died, so my, my cousin, his mother died of leukemia, so he came to us and was our eldest brother, so to say. Um, but not, no, I mean, not, being sure what happened to the father. That really was, was, I mean, they were pretty sure that he died, but no official thing. Yeah. My grandmother told me some stories, but they were in the countryside, so they didn't have to, to to starve. They had enough food and the bombs were not so much on them, more in the cities. But, yeah. And when we did a constellation in, in Hungary, Hungary uh, two years, four, three years ago, I had the 
the role of the European soil. And I don't want to talk about the whole thing, but there was one encounter with the representative of Germany and we were some meters apart, but we looked at each other's eyes and she was like in tears. She was like all the time in tears. And I had this feeling, oh my God, thousands and thousands years of blood soaked soy. It was so tangible. So it's not only the last war, it's all the wars before. And there was no generation that didn't have war. So we are the first one. Uh, of course, <laughs> I left out. Excuse me, I say, yeah. okay, if you want us to add one. Yeah, I just want to add because uh, my mother also lost her brother and he was also missing and it took a long time to find out where he was and my grandmother waited until her death that he would return and yeah. and. It just occurred to me that I sort of couldn't remember the word rape in English, <laughs> which is stupid or amazing. Uh, so I looked it up again and now of course I remember it and it was yeah, the rape of so many women. It is something like a collective trauma in Austria because when women attend a seminar and this topic is brought up, it's just havoc. So it's in everybody that being raped by a foreign army is just one of our traumas, I believe. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Tammy. I live in what's known as Canada. I was born in 1970 and my dad was born in 1940. So <clears throat> he hasn't talked much about his experience. Um, and for me, when I feel into this topic, I feel what has happened in Canada and that there's an ongoing war that's silent and not seen because this land was taken from the original inhabitants. And when I was in, uh, I went to visit Gertraud in Germany a few months ago and we went for a walk near her home and I was also struck by the feeling of how many generations of blood was on the land. And I didn't really know what I was experiencing. But I feel that here. I feel that here in this place where I live. And what is, I think most painful for me is it is hidden. Thank you, Luna and Victoria, for naming that, for this hiding of truth. And that's what I experience here, is the hiding of the truth. And the same, I feel, that the same wheels put into motion of nationhood and of um, the realities of the economy and these relationships between nations that is happening and living here in what's called Canada. And I was born in a place called Matsqui, which is on the west coast of Canada. And so contact 
happened very late. In, there are some communities who remember contact in living memory. And I, I think it's important to broaden our conversation into that reality because where uh, the, 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 the war isn't over here. It's not even acknowledged that it's happened. And, you know, the living parts of that is we have uh, Mordor in the north, what they call the tar sands, this living scar that affects all of humanity where indigenous communities don't have water. It's living, they're still taking children. That didn't stop with the 60s scoop. It's still happening today. And so I wanted to bring into our awareness, yes, this happened in the 40s and in the First World War. And I still feel it happening here. Thank you, Tammy. Can you explain what you mean with the children? Taking children? So there's, um, there's many children that are taken into foster care still today. Um, and a higher percentage of them come from indigenous families. And in the 60s, a part of what happened here in this country is that many, many, many children of Indigenous families were taken and as part of, um, as part of a, a erasure of Indigenous culture to bring them into white families so that they didn't have a connection to their, their culture and uh, the way that, that Indigenous people live and teach each other. It's a, it's a living culture from, from grandparent to grandchild. And so interrupting that cycle was a, a cultural act of war. And it's still happening today. Oh, thank you for this information. We, we are so absorbed with our European shit. <laughs> that we don't even know what is going on. I know from Mark that he said, America hasn't ever looked into history and acknowledged what has happened. And that we in Europe, at least we try to. So my ch I, I was born in 52, so it was after the war, but we were still having the, let's say the, the need, I remember, my mother had a garden, a vegetable garden, and we mainly had uh, food from there. And uh, it was very sort of primitive. In the evening, we ate bread with margarine and apples and things like that, you know. And once a, once a week on Sunday, there was some meat, things like that. Uh, and I, I didn't really know. Sometimes they talked about the war, that they tried to have a dog in the in the in the garden to avoid that people came to 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 steal the vegetables in this way but i never really understood where what what war was the only thing i realized was when sometimes war comrades from my father came every three two three years and then they sat together and laughed and told stories only the good stories the comradery stories but only in, shortly before he died, my father told me a little bit more. But it was one day and I sort of have forgotten. I remember this one story that he said they were in Finland facing the Russians and waiting and waiting and waiting for a long time, for months. And then one put a, 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 a bottle of vodka in the middle and the others put a bottle of grappa in the middle and they exchanged uh, 
uh, these things. Uh, and that was, for me, seems like a human attempt to handle this situation. Um, the brother of my father died and now my brother has done a lot of research to figure out where and if we can get hold of his rests or something. But in our family, nobody ever talked about it. We only knew there was a brother and that's it. And the silence, yeah, the silence. And then in, in school, the Third Reich, we didn't have as history. That was not, uh, no, it just wasn't. So we, we lived in this feeling of strange depression, let's say, which came over from, from, the, from the parents, but we didn't really know what it was. And uh, I certainly took on quite a bit of, of that. And as you see what I shared at the beginning, it's still, wow, or even more now than then. Then I could say, oh, okay, they died, oh, la, 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 no? But, um, and then the other thing, it's, it's a shame that Dorothy is not here because she would be the part of the Jews um, who had been ex expelled, <laughs> is not the right word. They had to flee for survive from our countries. My place where I was born is Coburg. And I only knew a few years by my brother doing a little bit of research and there is a book had come out that my city was the first one who had a Nazi mayor long before Hitler was, in, uh, was um, on, the, on the lead. And that already then, I think in 28 or something, the tortures began. And the, the normality that these uh, rioting, right, right wing, uh, how can you say, I would say bandits, they just um, uh, throw stones in the houses of Jews and, and things like that. And nobody, it's not true. Some people tried to, 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 to oppose that. And then they were the, uh, the address of, of uh, this violence. And up to a certain point, very courageous people tried to denounce it. And the state government, when it was not yet um, Nazi, but, you know, nothing happened. People had to sort of give up and were, were attacked themselves, those people who tried to, to ask for justice. And so getting to know that, it was hard. <laughs> and my, my father was born 19, my mother was born 21. So imagine my father was nine, my mother was seven, and they grow up in such an atmosphere. What childhood is that? You know, what a conflict. I, I really, I don't want to be in their shoes. And I can really understand that they couldn't work through that. And they were in silence because there was no help to, to understand that. Yeah, that's, that's my story. I guess what is in my heart is what is valuable to share? What is valuable to learn? For me, it's valuable to, to that the, the next generations, not only us, we have sort of gotten it by direct experience, that the next generations don't forget that that is and especially that we encourage to stop the beginnings. And I think we don't do a good job in that. We want to leave everybody, oh, everybody can do what they want. No, there are certain things which we have to go against it and, and don't allow people to do at their free will what they want when it is harmful or when it is denigrating, when it is, uh, how do you say that? Uh, anti, for instance, anti-Semitism, anti-whatever it is, when, when, you, uh, when you 
uh, accuse a group of people and uh, of something which they are not, you know. And I think we should have learned that. And even the Nazis, as you can see out of our shares, not everybody had this, this ideology in their head, you know. Some did, and badly. But I do think that most people were only not courageous enough to stop and say no at the right moment, which I can understand. I don't know. I always say I don't want to have been in those times and put in front of the decision what to do. Would I hide a Jew? Would I not? You know, I, I, in these situations, you don't know how you uh, react. And so, uh, Monia, you were uh, saying that the shadow work, the, the going into their own heart and see what is there and what you would be capable of doing, it's so important to know that. And it should be more fashionable to do that instead of being uh, amused with cell phones, with games, with I don't know what, you know, going into the inside and see how easy it is to blame others and how easy it is to maybe do the same thing in certain circumstances, you know. And that's really bothering me. Some years ago, I read a story about the wife of a commander of one of the, I don't recall which one, of the concentration camps. And they had five children. They had a house outside of that camp. Uh, and a garden, happy living somehow. <laughs> and uh, so he came always back. And they really loved each other on their level. <laughs> so, And um, years after the war, she was interviewed. And she said, I know my husband loved me and I never asked him to quit the job. I was not happy with it. I, in the name of love, I stayed and I never said anything. And that is my guilt. That is my responsibility because I'm almost sure that he would have gone with me. Yeah, and and that I was really in tears when I read that because it's sometimes we think we have to stay, we have to to whatever um, what it, it's uh, aushalten. <laughs> I don't know the English word. Endure, yes. I think. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and just sometimes it would have been one real conversation that made a difference. And yesterday, I, there was Tony Blair who was interviewed. And he said, the left doesn't know the the, the ultra left or the um, that when the ultra right and the ultra left when they fight the ultra wi uh, right wins. So we have to do something else than just being against. I want to bring up another uh, short thing to think about. When I did this uh, asking for pardon for the Germans for what they did, afterwards people came up to me and one was a high so soldier of the Italian army and he embraced me and said, you don't have to excuse yourself. We are only following orders. And that made me even more, more uncomfortable. So, wow. 
Um, right now I'm torn between the past and the present. And I guess one of the problems, and I don't say challenges, I say problems, is that it's in the spirit of the times, nobody tells me what to do. So how can you stop the beginnings of something when nobody is allowed to tell anybody what to do? So it's about a hierarchy of values. And this is the Scylla and Charybdis we are in between. It's on the one hand, you have political correctness, which is now almost becoming a joke. And because it's carried too far. And on the other hand, people just, and the younger generation, how should they, yeah, how, how would they allow to be told something? I know my grandchildren listen to me. They don't listen to their parents. It's, it's, there's another generation gap, I guess. But they know, somehow, they know that I, yeah, I'm comfortable in myself and I'm very balanced. And this is something that's missing because this is why the left and the right split up. They are not balanced in themselves. There is not this equilibrium. Um, what, as Tammy said, what is it we should learn? Well, the longer you look back at your life, you sort of, as Victoria said that, you can see a certain pattern, a continuity in your life. Um, but uh, as Gertrude was lucky that her father talked about it, my father hardly talked about the war. And I always thought it was the most exciting time of his life. And I gave him for Christmas, I gave him books about the war. And after about the third book, he said, no more books, please. And he uh, was with the health department in, in the army. He was as a dentist. And of course, this was where all the wounded and maimed came. And he had been a quiet person before, but afterwards he just worked and worked and worked and after midnight and you couldn't, you, he never talked about it. Uh, but oh, as you mentioned, the comrades, they, after the war, they, we had uh, contact to people we otherwise of dis different social levels, we otherwise would have never contacted. And we, and this was kept up until they died. So this is a kind of comradeship they, yeah. They keep up, they kept up after the war. Maybe this was what held them together and held them up. Oh, we got a new participant. Yeah, does this is it start, is it, does it start at 10 or at nine? Yeah, we have already done an hour, so we were missing you. I'm uh, sorry, I thought it, I, I, I strained my back and I've been on these Flexoril, these these things that blur me, and I couldn't remember if it was nine or ten. I'm so sorry to miss it. We will have maybe another occasion, and you can afterwards uh, see what we talked about. We were missing you because you are the only representative of the the people who had to flee. I will um, rename you so you appear under your own name, okay? Oh, instead of Bill Kucha. Yeah. <laughs> right. Thank you, Heidi. Oh, I'm so very sorry. Well, I'll watch it. And if there's another uh, focus on this, I'll, I'll for sure be there. So it's nine o'clock. For some reason, I thought it was 10. I'll write it on my calendar. 
So you know, sorry, everyone. Are they Dorothy, you, it's very nice that you came in because we were quite in a in a gloomy mood about what we shared about our uh, our own experiences and that of our parents. So coming in like this has a little bit uh, made a cut, and I think it, it it's good. I'm good, and here's some wildflowers <laughs> from our Oregon garden to wish you all well and. To lift the gloom, may the gloom lift. Okay. Good, Heidi. I'll watch it. I'll watch it with great interest, and I'll be here in a month. And maybe Diana Lindemann will be too. Okay, so we might uh, do a, a, another session. At this point, we are about 10 minutes. We still have more or less. We can go a little more, but... Uh, I'll listen. Yeah, what what would we invite? What do you suggest? What would we invite to, to share, Dorothy, maybe about your experience of your childhood, how your childhood went, and how if your parents talked about their experiences and things like that? We did that all, so it would be interesting to hear it from you too. Well, they never talked about it uh, while we were growing up, which seems very common. And what I lived with and what I've written about, and if I can find it, I'll send it, uh, was with a terrible, uh, quiet presence of my mother's uh, heartbreak and depression at having left her mother in Vienna, her mother would not come, and having lost uh, some very significant people in her life. And my father had rage and, um, he suffered greatly. He said more from the humiliation that he witnessed before they left Vienna, almost more than the deaths, which was very hard for me to understand. But my cousin said, well, he saw the humiliation, so it made a huge imprint. He looked out the window and he saw uh, old women and um, educated uh, Jews uh, on, the, on their knees scrubbing, I don't know what they were scrubbing, and then he saw buckets of water poured on them. So he, he was a Leo and he had an incredible sense of, I don't know, pride, I guess pride. And that's what really got him. At the end, what, before he died, he did a two hour tape for the Jewish Museum and Holocaust Study group here in Portland. And that was very, uh, very touching. But what I saw in it was his strength, you know, that uh, he went on. It was like we were talking about last time that outwardly uh, he was resilient and became successful and, you know, was an American. And inwardly uh, he carried a huge amount of uh, rage and, um, Oh, he just never felt good about himself. You know, he, that, that humiliation sort of went deep. And no matter how successful he was, he, uh, he didn't feel like he was a person of substance. So that, that's what I lived with, my mom's sadness and despair, wanting to die. She wanted to die the whole time she was raising us. So, and then, and that was it. That was what I saw. And now I'm having this renaissance uh, because of all of you and because of my participation that I called the Jewish Museum. And here in Portland is this group called Next Generation who are looking at and talking about and honoring uh, the incredible story that their mothers and grandmothers endured. So for me, this whole thing with all of you and now with them is like kind of an opening from that despair and anger into all these wonderful people who are welcoming me and are interested in sharing. So I don't feel gloom. You know, I, I feel like, um, we're celebrating the fact that uh, we've moved on 
and everyone in their own way has um, suffered or processed or not processed uh, what happened. Is that what you were hoping, at? Some, something like that, Heidi? Did I touch on your... Yeah, it's fine. Was... If anybody wants to ask her some questions because she has said very little or uh, um, had very little time, I wanted to say, or if you can add something uh, to that. Where, where were you born? In Portland, Oregon. Okay. My parents, they went to Trinidad for three years and waited uh, for what they needed to come into the United States. And then in 1942, I was born. They left Vienna in 38, right after Kristallnacht, right after uh, the Nazis marched in and then spent their time maybe healing in a way because Trinidad was a beautiful place for them to be, tropical and simple. So, and then they came to New York and then they came out to Portland. So I was born in Portland in 42 and my three brothers were born in Portland. So we all felt very American, even though my parents had heavy, my mother had a real heavy accent and was very Viennese. She, she never really turned into an American. She was always wonderfully odd. And uh, my dad kind of cleaned himself off and became an American man. So it was an interesting um, split between them. Heidi, I love the expression on your face. You're the only one I can see. It's really warm. I feel a huge warmth coming from you. Thank you. So let's You're do a sort of a check out. Uh, <sighs> oh, now I see. Now, oh, I see. Oh, Victoria, hi. <laughs> you are, are old you friends, uh, Vic and Victoria. And Moni was the hi, Moni. <laughs> okay, who wants to start to... to I'm still pondering, Gertraud. I'm still pondering on uh, Tammy's question. So how can we have that to, to be aware and to uncover, like Luna said? Um, and at the same time, how can we create the future in another way and, and don't be stuck in what happened, but to transform that into a way of being in the world that makes a difference and not just anti-Nazi <laughs> or anti-whatever. So I'm very grateful for that conversation. I'm very happy <laughs> because I just came back from from Greece, from the meditation retreat. And um, I think that needs another conversation about it. Uh, so I'm not done, <laughs> not with the sharing, but with what does that mean for us? And so I would love to have another conversation about it. With Dorothy <laughs> from the For beginning. sure, nine o'clock, I've got it written here. It's, I don't know if it's a, I'm sure Victoria will make some mysterious otherworldly meaning of it. And I myself do some Freudian meaning that of all the conversations I was sitting here waiting for it to start, I come an hour late. That's got to mean something right for all the Freudians and the Jungians, so. Forgive me, I forgive myself because that's, that, that, was, uh, that was something that I, didn't, I wasn't aware of wanting to do. <laughs> yeah, 
Yes, I, I think a very practical meaning of you coming in our late Dorothy is that this is only the beginning. And I also feel very strongly that we need another conversation. I will say goodbye for now because unfortunately I will have to go. I have uh, another appointment. But I was thinking the whole time, you know, my uh, work in therapy and past lives and the Jungian stuff and all that, it, 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 become, it became very, very clear throughout the years that we all have it in us, in our soul, both the, the victim and the aggressor. And if I ask myself, is there anyone on the planet today that I would trust of not becoming the aggressor? I would say probably very, very few people. I think we are still in the state where it's in us and it can come up and it can come out in the wrong way. And therefore, I think the really, really interesting question is, who is it that we would trust not to become an aggressor anymore. And I do see a certain type of person in front of me. And I wouldn't even say that they are necessary, like say Buddhist meditators, but I would say that they are meditators. I think the people I would trust the most is are people who have started some inner journey out of the necessity that they notice that they can become aggressors at any moment. I think that is like the starting point. And I think that's why we can celebrate this discussion so very much, because I think it is a very valuable starting point that when we realize nothing has been done yet, but we maybe came to the conclusion that something has to start and there has to be a paradigm shift. And I think the paradigm shift is that we don't look for solutions out there anymore. I don't think there's a right politics. I don't think that there's a right system. I don't think that there is a right way from the outside to guarantee that things like that won't happen. But I think we can start guaranteeing it from within. When we start changing ourselves, I think that's the first step. And I have a great faith in that. I think that we live in a times when more and more people notice that it's an inner change that we need. And the only person we can change is ourselves. And when we do it in a large scale, I think that will make a real great transformation, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. I say goodbye for now. And thank you so much for inviting me. I really hope that there will be another conversation. I'm looking forward to that. I hope so too. Are you in Greece, Victoria? No, I'm in there? Budapest. I'm back. Oh, okay, I'm back. good. I have to leave because I had an appointment. Bye. Uh, yeah, me too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to check out. Hi, Dorothy. Uh, I think that what touched me most, and thank you so much, Victoria, for what you just brought, is, is how I can own what I can own here. And what touched me most actually is Heidi standing up and in, in that place and saying, and apologizing. And I think that these, these ways that we, that we understand the trauma from our own experience from and tying in the ancestral aspects of it, I think this longer sense of time and the presence of the moment and really understanding uh, how and where we can take responsibility and be different in it. There's something I think that's really rich and possible for us to transform inside ourselves as Victoria was saying. And so I, I welcome more experiences of being able to do that and do that together so that we can take, uh, take that responsibility as the, the stewards of culture and humanity that each one of us are. So thank you everyone so much for today. Uh, I would like to add that it feels to me like we are just scratching the surface and we can go enormously deeper 
And I guess it's our responsibility to go deeper in the way we are here and in this we space we have, which is rare because there are not that many we spaces of this kind. And I thank Heidi for the opportunity and maybe we can make a series out of this. It's necessary, I feel it in my bones. It's necessary to do it. Thank you all. I am a meditator. I'm so touched by everyone on this call and um, yeah, what I really am feeling is what's being asked of us right now. Um, that we are, in a sense, the largest movement that's ever happened. This we-ness is actually, um, there are people all over the world who are wanting to wake up, who are wanting to look, who are wanting to put themselves in uncomfortable situations in order to heal. And the more we come together, the more we can feel that um, connection. But I do feel like it's been very underground. Uh, but it's, it's happening all over. It's a huge movement. Uh, so I, I wanted to acknowledge that. And I also wanted to, um, yes, also comment on the perpetrator and victim relationship and how deeply intimate it actually is. And thank you, Victoria, for speaking to that inside of each of us. Um, and that it's what's also being asked right now is a new game, a new way of playing as a human being. It's not about good and bad, uh, about this duality, um, but about really healing that divide within ourselves and having a different conversation about what we can do and be as human beings so that we don't repeat this, this game blindly of them and us, that it's all inside of us. We are each other. I am another yourself in the cash. Thank you so much, everyone, and I look forward to more conversations with all of you. Thank you. Dorothy, you want to say something for? Uh, I just realized that this is a huge gift, and I kind of missed the unwrapping of the package, and I'll watch uh, what you all talked about and where you were. And I, I, of course, I have to say, of course, am very grateful to be here. I'm very, very interested and excited and personally involved with this. So thank you. Thank you, Heidi. And thank you, each and every one of you. I, I'm really beginning to trust and uh, love you all. Mm -hmm. It's a warmth I feel in my heart when I see all of you. I can only see four of you, but it was lovely to see uh, Luna and um, I forgot your name. Tammy? Yeah. <laughs> Tammy. I love seeing Luna and Tammy again. <laughs> so glad. Thank you, Dorothy. And um, for me, this conversation has a little bit uh, given Sol Solievo um, has given me some more lightness and Yevo. Uh, yeah and at the same time that's it both together at the same time this yeah we are trying to do something but I just half hour before the conversation I had another of these experiences where people in the red energy are just unwilling and unable to to, 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 to even listen and to just do and make war. So sometimes I'm preoccupied.
because so many people are living in this energy of just me, 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 what I need is important and you have to, when you say something, it's, um, you know, things like that. I don't want to go into the detail, but um, yeah, we need to go inside. At the moment, I begin again to be a meditator for a long time. Uh, I couldn't do it uh, after the situation with Mark. It was just not, not there. So maybe sooner or later you can trust me. <laughs> Although other people say they just don't trust me. <laughs> and went away. Bam. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, okay. And I'm really happy that you are with me in this conversation because it's very, very dear to my heart and that we uh, do it together. And maybe, as you said, Monia, in a different setting too, and not in, inside Women Matters because then we would be uh, only focused on that. Uh, that wouldn't be, you know, and also include men. That would be a good thing. So I will think about it. Give me also your suggestions how we could do that. And thank you. See you, see you soon. Thank you. Namaste. <laughs> thank Namaste. You. Thank you.